Tackling is one of the hardest things to do in football, and that's why in this video, we called in Scott Lawyer, the Director of Programming and Analytics for Atavis. And if you're unfamiliar with Atavis, they're one of the top tackling companies in football today. So we brought him in to teach you how to tackle properly, how to teach tackling, and how to identify when poor tackles are being made and how to correct them. And by the end of this video, you'll learn everything that you need to know about tackling and how to teach it effectively. So when it comes to Atavis, um, I always like to start with this. It's not really a problem, but it's a dilemma. Um, you know, tackling is the most common transaction in football, along with blocking. It happens on every play. Um, so we always like to take a systematic approach to teaching tackling. That's where I really feel that we bring the most value to our coaches. We want to be an extension of your coaching staff. Um, so being able to build confidence in the tacklers, especially at the youth level, is key for us. That way, it trans you're working on these drills throughout practice. That way, on Saturday or Friday when you're playing, it's just second nature and it's all just free flowing. And that's where Adivis really prides and holds our hat on is this confidence and the safety of the tackle. So our philosophy is really built on these four concepts. First, we want to identify the types of tackler, tackles our athletes are in. So is it more of a profile, you know, in the box type of tackle or is it more out in space, more of your traditional, you know, lateral roll tackle, as they called it in the past. Um, by doing that, we can increase situational awareness. And this is key. Um, being able to find out where your players are spending most of their times. Like I said, is it going to be in that positive situation? We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but more of a head-up tackle or is it out in space in the negative? That way, as a coach, you're able to better delegate your practice time and be able to you know, pick and choose which drills that your players are you know, struggling with the most. And then from there, we're able, this is where we kind of help coaches the most, Chris, is we analyze all the tackles and label the issues um, for you guys. So when, when it comes to off-season programming, you're going to have, you know, a library uh, and huddle, for example, of 100 plus tackles, good and bad examples of where your team really um, did well in terms of tackling and where are some areas of improvement. That way we can help your offseason programming and really pinpoint the, the key, you know, the key skills we need to focus on. And then the biggest thing I would say, say for coaches, especially at the high school and youth level, is you want to create a universal language around tackling. And this is the same thing when it comes, you know, you're putting in a blitz package, right, as a defensive guy, you know. Um, there's nothing worse than one coach saying something and another coach kind of contradicting right. that with their own their own thing. Right. So we don't really care what words you're using um, as long as it's all consistent around tackling. I think that really helps your players be more confident, um, and it just allows your your um, you know your philosophy to be that much more um, easily translated to the player so yeah and scott i think the biggest one for me like if i could go back like for me seven years ago eight years ago when i started coaching i think number one like i wish i learned that at the beginning of my career right like yeah. how how to identify the types of tackle because i think a lot of coaches like using high school coaches will just line up you know two bags and have guys go head to head and that's their tackling drill it's like right. no you see like you said there and we're going to talk about it in a minute but like there's pursuit tackling there's angle tackling there's head-on profile tackling that there's a lot more that guys encounter throughout the game so i, I thought number one stuck out to me the most especially as a young coach it's like i wish i knew that and how to attack that and how to practice that uh well, when i was a younger coach for sure and that's a that's a great point i think that's the yeah. key thing um you know, someone in our, in our company used to ask, if you have one coach on your staff that you would not want teaching tackling, then you have an issue. Um, so like right. I said before, our job is to come in and just give you more of a, you know, give you guys the foundation to be successful when it comes to teaching tackling. And then from there, you know, we have coaches that have 50, 40 years of experience, right? We want them to take our drills. We want them to take our philosophy and add to it and supplement that. Um, but like I said, we just want to give you guys just the tools to start off and hit the ground running. And then from there, we can build off and, and kind of tweak things to fit your program more, more specifically. Yeah. All right, so here it is. I mean, um, it was really funny, Chris. When I first started working for Atavis, and you know, I heard it was a rugby company, and I, I, obviously I have experience with it playing at Washington, but... I found that, you know, tackling is the same thing, whether it be rugby or football, it's all the same thing. But right. in rugby, they had to evolve. They had to shift the way they were thinking because they don't have the equipment to feel protected, right? Um, but we still want to be – there was a misconception about five or six years ago about the rugby-style tackle and the Atavis tackle that it was – that we're taking away from the game. No, you can see here, it is as physical as can be. We have no pads. This is live. Um, and you can see the physical feedback of the runner. You see in his face, his body's jolting um, because we want to dominate contact, maximizing uh, power and control by using the same foot, same shoulder. And we have a lot of examples today that's going to help kind of bring home this whole message of maximizing these two things. All right, so I spoke to it earlier, the situations. 
Um, this is our, our tackle wheel that we use here at Avis, and it really helps to break up the situations that the athletes are facing. So, for example, let's start with the positive. In the green area, you're going to see your more, more traditional, I say, but the profound angle tackle. Now, m both me and you know this, that these, are ha these type of tackle tackles are happening less and less in today's football because why? Offenses are expanding. You have better athletes. Right. You have, you know, the game is shifting where now we want to make you play in this phone booth and, and get you to miss. That way we create more explosive plays on the offensive end. So what we found in our data actually, Chris, is that these profound angle tackle tackles are happening about 40% of the game versus you know 60% in this negative situation. So keep that in mind. I think it's really important because growing up, I was always focused just on the profile head up tackle in the box, right? The old school, you know, right, grab right. cloth and in this strain for five seconds when it wasn't really applicable to a game situation. Um, so the key about the profile in and uh, in the angle is to focus on power and control, and we can uh, dominate by knocking the runner backwards. Now, when we get to this negative situation. Uh, we're not truly saying that the athlete did anything wrong in a sense. We're just saying that they had no more ability to generate power, and we solely want to focus on control here. So you see this lateral tackle? Um, we actually used to call it the roll tackle, um, and I think that's where the hawk roll and the seahawk roll, that all started, like I said, about six or seven years ago. But we slowly shifted from the roll to calling it a lateral, which is not only more descriptive, but the reason why we did that is roll tackles are more of an outcome of momentum. I say this a bunch to whether it be on Twitter or you want to talk to coaches, that we, there's not going to be one coach that's going to be on the field or during practice and say, hey, I want you to go roll that dude, right? right. It's not, we don't want it to be something that is taught, um, rather because the reason why is a lot of times you see, especially with the younger athletes, when they're emphasizing that role so much, they're actually pulling their body and their shoulder off the runner, and he's allowing them to get more yards after contact versus focusing on making solid shoulder contact and aggressive punch and wrap, that's all the things that help you maximize that lateral when you're maybe at a disadvantage when it comes to momentum. Um, right. And then the chase tackle is more, you know, trailing position like a heel clip or, you know, retracing on a screen, for example. Um, but, yeah, I would say the most pop, most common tackles that we see now are going to be the angle and lateral tackle in today's modern football. Yeah, I think this is a great graphic here to demonstrate that, too, of like if if your entry point is from an angle or if it's from the side. And as you're talking about lateral, that's like chasing down a bubble, chasing down a, a pass that's caught, chasing down something in open field. You know, makes sense. But, yeah, like you said, the game gang so much just pitch and catch now as opposed right. to line up, 21 personnel, shove it down your throat. Exactly. Makes sense. Yep. So here, just to further, further uh, illustrate that positive, remember we want to maximize power and control here, coaches, to dominate, knock the runner backwards. Here's going to be a practice clip. So it's kind of like, you know, a, a flare pass, one-on-one -on -one, uh, type open field drill. But he's going to be tagging off on the runner here, and it's going to be simulating an angle-like tackle, positive tackle, okay? Okay. Coach, can you talk a little bit about uh, the putting the two hands on the hip and why we want to do that? Oh, you yeah. Know, I see that sure. clip here. He's, he's running downhill. He's getting two hands up on the hip. Um, yes. Talk a little <laughs> about that. Like, you know, they have no pads on, right? So yes. it's not like this, this is something you can do. Off season, all, in season, all year in your right, backyard, exactly. wherever, yeah. And we actually, I'm glad you asked that, Chris, because we're actually going to have a full section dedicated to our types of tempo that we use here at Avis. But yeah, we actually learned this from uh, Coach Urban Meyer and the um, Ohio State staff about eight years ago when we first started. And we always talked about, I think, especially now. Um, I say now, but you know, seven on seven type of football, where now we're just tagging off and that whole thing is going. I'm not going to say it builds bad habits, but you often see. Um, during the season that when you run, you know, let's say seven on seven or um, tag tempo, you have guys doing the whole run by tackle. I got them, coach, right? Um, we learned that that doesn't translate to the best habits, but also a real, as a coach, it doesn't give you much confidence that in a game he's going to make that tackle. So what we use here is what we call palms down uh, tag off. And really it's just to be more descriptive, but what it does, Chris, is it makes the athlete focus on that near hip, but also make sure they have bent elbows and they're actually, you know, lowering their body profile versus running by and they're, they're tagging off and their body heightens and it's just not transferable to game. So right. we've adopted this over the last years and it's been really successful. I'm not going to say it's the easiest thing to teach because the coach is like, palms down. What are you? Once you get past the whole term, you know, the, all the, the terminology and the wording of it and just focus on the technique, it's um, really a slight difference and a slight tweak that you can make that's going to you know, make tremendous um, improvements for your defense. Great. Great. Here's a game example. 
So obviously it's going to be live, but um, you know, this is everything we're looking for when it comes to like a prototype tackle, but really this is going to illustrate a, a positive tackle as well. So more of an angle profile right here. You see the defender does a great job of closing space. Same foot, same shoulder, and a great finish. So this would be like a textbook, what I call um, effective, but also repeatable tackle. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Like, can we do this nine out of ten times with the same outcome? I believe, you know, this, this is more of a, a, a more of a sustainable tackle. All right, so here's this again, that negative. So remember, there's no power here. We solely want to focus on control here. So here's an example you're going to see from practice, kind of your hinge, apex player, retracing. And he's going to end off tagging off in like a, na a negative chase tackle angle. See it? So still using the palms down. Okay. Yep. Now here's going to be a practice film, a uh, game cl clip. And I love this one. It's a little outdated, but this actually debunks the whole roll tackle right here. So this is actually Jabril Pepper. So we know if he doesn't, if he this guy misses his tackle, he's probably going to the house. Right. But um, let me slow it down for you. So 43 here. The stiff arm, too, is becoming way more prominent in today's football, right? I mean, over the last two or three years, I'm seeing athletes with stiff arm like no, no other. And what, I, what we call this is the swipe or the collapse method. I had a video on this a few weeks ago. But you see how he uses his off arm, Chris, and he collapses the runner's arm? Right. Now he's able to get deep into the runner's arm with his near shoulder. So, and also, watch, when he finishes this, there's no roll. He just drops him right there for about one to two yards after contact versus a, a 30 plus yard gain. Right. Um, so a lot of times players would have the tendency to want to roll him. And I'm not saying the roll is bad, but right here, it's, it's, it wouldn't be necessary. Okay. All right. So moving on. So, you know, out of this, we really do pride ourselves on taking a two step approach to teaching tackling. So we break it up into two components being one, the pre contact, which is more the tracking, you know, out in space type of um, elements. And the key here when we're looking at uh, pre-contact is to, max, to have control of movement to maximize body-on-body -body contact. That's all we're looking for. Now within the contact zone, which is more of the conversation now, um, where we're hitting, what we're hitting with, that's gonna be that tackle zone, that, that yellow area. And the key thing that we wanna uh, focus on here, Chris, is to max, maximize power and control. Um, so as we get into this, we'll break down these layers more and more. Okay, so here it is, a pre-contact. So these zones right here to the right, coaches, are very, um, they, they're ingrained in our system so much when it comes to either our drills, but also how we track our data and analyze our players. So let's quickly go through each of these levels. First, we have the evaluation zone. So this is really where we're focusing on closing space. Probably the most critical to your defensive success is being able to close space and limit the runner's options. Um, next, we have the decision-making zone, which is all about leverage, so targeting for effective shoulder contact. So this is more of that, you know, tracking the near hip, mimicking the runner's movement. That way we can maximize shoulder contact. And then lastly, in the action zone, imagine this is more, you know, two to three yards prior to contact, what we call the hula hoop in a sense. Um, probably the most undercoached tech portion of the pre-contact is the footwork because yeah. it tends to get overlooked. But right. it's really important because it's just, this is going to help you uh, maximize force and momentum into contact. So everything from your power step to an effective shoulder width base, all that good stuff is going to help you have that power and generate that, um, that force. That way we can dominate and limit yards after contact. So one thing to keep in mind here, coaches, is that everything here is sequential when it comes to these three zones. So, for example, in order to have good footwork, we really need to close space, take good angles to set yourself up for that. Because we all can agree, if you don't close space and you stop and you shut it down seven yards too early, you're most likely not going to be making, uh, having an opportunity making shoulder contact or have your footwork be, in, be a factor. So yep. everything here is sequential. Um, any questions on this? Does it seem pretty? You know, no, I, this is great. Yeah, okay. you know, I think this is a good visualization for like a safety or a corner or, you know, linebackers that are collapsing space now. Like you hit all of these zones within, what, six, seven yards of the evaluation zone then the decision zone starts to collapse and so i think this is a good realization of like i'm starting from deep and i'm collapsing down and i need to check off all these boxes as i'm getting towards the ball carry yeah and actually that's a yeah. great point i actually forgot that so yeah. a lot of times when i present this even to the nfl level um they always ask are these zones based on are predicated on any certain yardage and you kind of hit, hit on that 
when you're looking at this, you typically just think, okay, my single high safety or my linebacker. But actually, it's not te- it's not technically tied to yardage because, for example, and we'll talk a little, we'll actually get into this later on. But for a D lineman, our evaluation zone is very bang bang, right? It's right now, basically yeah. it means that. I'm off the block, and now this guy's in my lap. Okay, I'm a part of the play. I, I have entered the the closing space phase. Now, maybe at that point, in a situation like that, the leverage probably doesn't really have a factor because it's I'm off the block, and he's right there. Um, but there will be some footwork elements as well. So, yes, by position, these zones kind of you know hold a different weight. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, that's yeah. a big point. Okay, so moving into the contact. So these are more self-explanatory, but um, this is a second phase. And, excuse me, the body position is all about maximizing power and control. So we took a lot from, like, you know, professional boxers and power lifters on how we really maximize body position. So a lot of things that we talk about is having a neutral neck, being able to see what you're hitting, right? So, for example, uh, remember, um, you know, about 10 to 15 years ago in the squat rack, uh, you want to get your eyes to the sky, right? You would say, look up in the sky, look in the ceiling. But now it slowly has shifted where now we want to maintain a neutral neck and see over our sunglasses or, you know, eyes over the um, eyebrows in a sense. That's the same thing when it comes to tackling. Basically the old the old saying of see what you hit. Um, right. So being able to have a maintain a neutral neck because evolution has taught us that our body is in the safest, most effective position when our head is in a neutral position versus either turned or looking up, so or mm, are ob- obviously down as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Because you're not able to brace um, yourself for those collisions, but also that's what we have what we call rotational force. A lot of times, whenever you see defenders duck their head, a lot of times when they take the crown of the head, their their head is taking the brunt of that collision, and we're just our body is just not naturally um, our head is not naturally you know equipped to handle that. Yeah, um, to absorb that contact. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. So then the strike is um, more probably the most important, obviously, because this is what's going to help keep our head out of the equation. Um, But really what we're looking at here is having near shoulder contact. So one thing I always say, and my coach, my linebacker coach did a great job of teaching me this, is we want to stay inside in front of our man. So when we get the whole where's the head at question, um, I really don't even talk about that. I really talk about it's a leverage tackle. That's why... If you're staying inside in front of your man, meaning, meaning that you're maintaining near hip leverage, that's going to show you, okay, I, I know I'm going to be making my right shoulder contact here. That's going to keep my head out, right? So they go leverage and striking go hand in hand because I want to stay inside in front, but also that's going to help you uh, dictate what shoulder you need to be making contact with. Yep. But then also um, is the punch element, which, um, I, you know, if I was in person, it'd be much more, much more easy to explain, but... I was taught too is growing up is grab cloth or the whole Superman tackle, get big, right? You remember that? Yep. Yep. And the issue with that is for our D linemen, our six, you know, three, 300 pound guys, that's easy. That happens, uh, they, that happens naturally and they end up being pretty successful in the tackle. But what that tends to lead to is more uh, chest contact, which leads to yards after contact. But also what you're doing there is you're exposing the shoulder to, you know, injuries. Um, by your opening up that ligament versus what we call the jab punch, so keeping it tight to the shoulder. If you throw your arm out like this coaches that are watching, if you just throw your arm out like a punch, you'll see that your whole joint and your whole ca- your butt, your um, shoulder is all protected by that muscle. It's all flexed up versus when you get wide or get out like this at a 90-degree angle, you expose a lot of that shoulder, um, that shoulder joint to uh, so stuff, you know, injuries. And, you know, me personally, I had two labrum surgeries, because I, a lot of, in high school, you're able to get away with the um, the arm tackles. Uh, but once you translate to the higher levels, trying to you know tackle Christian McCaffrey like that or Marcus Mariota, it's just not going to happen. So yeah. you got to be able to try to keep that punch tight to the body and really generate that that punch and moment that force and momentum as well. And then the last part is the finish. So more self-explanatory, but I always like to say that the body position, the strike, is how we how we maximize and create power control. But the finish is how we maintain that. So we want to have an aggressive leg drive. So, you know, we used to say drive for five, and that's easy to say. But it's, we know in a real game that's not super realistic. So really out of this, we say one to two hard steps in the ground after contact is going to be sufficient enough. And then when it comes to the um, the wrap, we want, want to just grab, 
you know, squeeze the air out of the runner to really limit yards at the contact. And really what we're looking for is to maintain control all the way to the completion of the play, whether that be to the ground or out of bounds, wherever, the whistle. Um, that's what we're just looking for when it comes to a proper proper wrap. Now, Scott, when, would you say, like, missed tackles are a cause of, like, what? And I know it's that's kind of an open-ended question. You're probably going to say it depends on certain things. But, like, would it be more the wrap? Would it be the, the approach in the evaluation zone? Like, where do you think missed tackles out of all these zones are, are definitely missed the most? Ah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. I think at, le- at various levels they, they kind of tend to vary. But I would say specifically at the high school level, most of your missed tackles are going to come from – either closing space, not closing space. So um, we'll have some examples a little bit later, but what we track here is called preventable yards at Atavis. And meaning what that means is basically when you had ability to, it's the hidden yardage where a defender stops and they shut it down early and that runner is gaining that yards, yardage, but he's not moving forward. That tends to lead to what we call the most explosive plays, but also non-contact misses. Um, so that's one of the main ones. And also a little bit of near hip, near hip leverage where, Defenders are over pursuing. Maybe they're closing space really well, but their eye discipline is bad. And now you have the whole arm tackle where they're whiffing, over pursuing. It, it leads to um, you know missed tackles that way. So I would say mainly um, you know closing space leverage at the high school youth level. But I would say at the NFL college level, it's more the broken tackles, meaning that they're making good body on con- body contact because they're closing space well. But maybe they have bad. You know, bad habits, I say, where they're striking with the chest or maybe go leading with the head that will lead to that rotational force and more of a, a missed tackle from a broken, broken tackle. Makes sense. Got it. Yes, sir. OK, so here's a quick um, kind of summary for our coaches. So on the left hand side, we have our pre-contact, which is all again, remember, closing space to limit the runner's options. And I kind of for, I kind of glanced over this portion because I know I don't want to get too much into our, our, our later later segments, but. For D linemen as well, we're looking at, in the closing space realm, we're looking at them to get off blocks in an effective manner. Um, so really closing space for our safeties is more of that, that pursuit, that continuous pursuit. But for our linebackers, indeed, our front seven, it's simply, okay, I got to get off this block and put myself in a position to make effective contact. So that's my closing space, and we call it the reaction piece. Um, so I wanted to hit on that before I, we move yeah. on. Leverage is all about targeting for effective shoulder contact, right? So we want to take good angles in the contact but also track the near hip, mimic the runner's movement. And then uh, the final portion is going to be our footwork, uh, which happens in the action zone, which is all about maximizing force and momentum. Now we move on to the right-hand side. Everything here is simultaneous again. So body position to maximize power and safety. We want to have a great strike with the near shoulder, preferably, um, a loaded jab punch, and then have that all come together with a nice finish to maintain power and control. Um, so here's a quick summary for our coaches. All right, any questions, you know, before I move on to our, our drill development portion? No, nope, feel pretty good. All right. Okay, so now this is how we're really going to, for like this bare bones, being able to teach tackling all year round, um, this is going to be really important for our coaches. Um, so at Adivis, we actually have three specific types of drills, um, one being technical, also, we have decision-making drills and game-based drills. And we'll quickly go through um, all three of these drills. But they really, you know, help you guys bring a, bring a, bring an element of, you know, not predictability, but, um, you know, uh, being able to have a routine, in a sense, when it comes to tackling. Because I think a lot of times coaches go into, I think you mentioned this earlier, Chris, is they go into practice and they don't, they don't necessarily know what tackling drills they want to run or how long they should be spending or what's the direct, what's the outcome they're looking for. So this portion is huge when it comes to being able to create a system that helps you be more confident as a coach, and that way you're doing a better job of articulating to the players, and it's all just helping the flow. Yep. So when it comes to technical drills, these are the very you know technique you know technique focus where maybe you're striking a bag or it's low impact. We're really focusing on movement and execution. As a coach, you can expect about 90 to 100 percent success because. They should be really clear and repeatable actions, okay? So we want to use very direct feedback when it comes to teaching technical drills. Now, decision-making drills are probably, I, I, I'm hesitant to say this, but I think these are the most important because it's the bridge between a technical and game-based drill. So decision-making drill is basically now we're adding one or two options to the drill that helps force the player to problem-solve. And I always like to use this antidote because when I was playing at Washington, uh, we had a good amount of uh, drills that we did, right? But... I would say, um, Atavis came in, they told me this after I, got, I started working for Atavis. They said, 
when we looked at all your guys' drills that you were running as a player, as players, about 80% of your drills were in technical, and you had 20% in game base. So we had no decision making drills. So for example, uh, okay. you know, technical drills would just be like, you know, two step strike or striking a tackle wheel, um, kind of those like low impact drills. But now all of a sudden, you know, for spring or when uh, we had some fans come out, we would do like the gauntlet drill or a one v one flare pass drill out in space with the with the running backs. And that for a linebacker, especially for me, that was really tough because you don't have that bridge to help you build the confidence to be successful in those game-based drills. So I always like to talk about decision-making drills because I think those tend to get overlooked, um, but they're really important to your success. Yep. Now, game-based drills are all the drills that we love to do because they're they're more chaotic, unpredictable, but they simulate um, you know what you're going to face on Fridays and Saturdays. So there you're going to see the expectation does drop to 60 to 70% because we do want these to be taxing drills. We want them to be somewhat you know, like I said, unpredictable. That way they're failing, but also they're building that, mus- that muscle memory and confidence. That way you revisit the drill, you know, maybe a couple of days later, you should hope for that skill retention and that, that carryover to happen. So I always love to talk about these three drills because three types of drills, because it really helps you guys as coaches be more confident uh, when teaching out of the system. Yeah. It helps you build buckets too. And essentially like I can, right. you know, create drills in each bucket, but I love, I love the expectation and success rate too, because I think as a defensive coach, you're probably thinking we need to hit every single tackle and it needs to be perfect. Yes. But let's talk, uh, the real world where essentially, like you said, game base is going to be 60 to 70%. I'm sure in a game, it might even be less than that, right? Because things are happening so fast. But right. if you have the expectation, like we want to hit this number here, at least when you go up to watch film after practice, you know, like, hey, we're hitting this. As you said, right, if they fail, it's okay to fail and just got to learn from it and then change your muscle memory a little bit in a sense of how you're approaching rap the whole nine yards. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so I kind of talked about it a little bit. But, yeah, just real quick reminder. So this is technical drills. These are all about the coach. I always say that it's okay to overco- um, overcoach these drills because you want them to be – you're expecting 90 to 100%. So if a couple reps aren't looking right – it's okay to stop them and really get, you know, if you have to get involved and show them how to do it, get, you know, we always encourage that when it comes to technical drills uh, because they're really focused on power and safety. So a lot of times you might use more like low impact drills or maybe we might recommend, you know, a tackle wheel or um, a crash pad or something like that. And this is really important too as coaches that when it comes to your feedback in these specific types of drills, we want to use very direct instruction when using, uh, when coaching technical drills. So you might think, you know, say stuff such as, you know, use your near foot, use your near shoulder. Um, that way you're giving them all the tools to be successful. Um, that way we have clear and repeatable movement. So really important. I, I always like to talk about this because a lot of our coaches are teachers or have been teachers. So this is very similar to like in a classroom in a sense where you're not going to jump to algebra without learning basic, you know, subtraction and addition. Right. So it's the same thing when it comes to tackling. Um, you want to really create that foundation. That way you can build off and, and show kind of a progression. So that's our technical drills. Yep. And then here what we have is our close and gather drill. And there'll be a few angles of this, but this is really um, kind of focusing on mimicking of the near hip, right? So tracking the near hip, but also closing space is a couple elements here. But this is going to be a pre-contact drill. So out of this, we, we have a pre-contact and contact focused drills. But all of our drills, they're going to have only about two to three things that you want to focus on. Because once you get beyond that, it becomes too convoluted. You're going to be causing confusion. So this drill is simply focusing on closing space and tracking your hip. So, for example, let's see. This is a good angle, Chris. So you see how there are these cones right here, Chris? These cones. So these are designated spots for the offense where they know they have to either run or gather in between these short or short strided, whatever you want to call. But for us as a defense – that eliminates all problems, all decision-making from it. So now we simply know there's more predictability, right? So, for example, we might have it a little bit later, but if you wanted to switch this to a close and gather choice, you simply would just take out these um, these inside cones and you would just let the, co- the runner dictate the pace of the drill. So now, as a defender, I have to think on the fly and problem-solve. So that's how you can make a quick uh, tweak to this close and gather drill. But this is a pretty standard one. We did this at Washington. You probably see it all over social media, but I really love this drill. Um, for example, maybe with your front seven guys, I always get this question. This is a lot of space for my, my three tech to be clo- to be covering. 
So what I recommend here is maybe we condense it down to about 10 to 15 yards. So this, this original grid is about 20 yards, coaches. I would yeah. condense it down to, um, to about 15, and I would just flip my shoulders to be more of a, a positive or simulate um, a squared position versus right here, as a defensive back, this is more of a trail, of, trail position. So you're simulating more of a negative. But I simply just uh, flip their shoulders, and you maybe add like a cut block or a block destruction task to it, and now you have a very applicable drill to your um, linebackers and D linemen right there. So just being able to make like minor that. tweaks yeah. like that is really important. Okay. So I love that. That's our closing gather drill. Yep. All right. So now we have more of a contact focused technical drill. So this is like our bare bones, like you know, day one type drill. So that's why you see your, our players, our athletes are on their on the ground because what we want to do is we want to teach them. Uh, how to slowly work up to their feet. So what this drill is focusing on, for example, is going to be one body position. So that's why we start them down because you might have a 6'5 D lineman versus a you know 5'11 corner. Their body positions are all going to be very right, or where they want to strike, their strike zone. So starting them on the ground, that naturally helps them be able to find, okay, where's that sweet spot? So, and what I mean by strike zone coaches is, for us, we look kind of like similar to baseball, below the chest plate to above the knees, okay? Yep. So if you were just to run this drill from day one and have them on their feet, I guarantee you have a lot of guys striking above the shoulder or maybe even too low. Um, so this is a great drill for that. And then also we want to focus on shoulder contact here and also a little bit of the punch. So those are about three things that we focus on. So this is our one knee strike drill. And this guy over to the far right does a really pretty good job, right? And we just want to focus on on go, you might have about three or four pairs going at once. So you really get to maximize your practice time. See that right there? Same foot, same shoulder, low impact to the ground, and we all do that. So you might get two or three reps, and then you might have them flip-flop. Now we're going to our left shoulder, and then we go, and with it, within about five minutes, you should have 15-plus reps of this going. So, Now, Scott, can you talk about the uh, the guy that's that's getting hit? How yes, would you sir. coach him up in a sense? So, uh, you know, he has his hands down, obviously, right? And then when he absorbs the contact, um, is yeah. he just like hugging the head and following down? Like, how do you want to coach him up? Yeah, great question, coach. So, for us, this is that's so great. Um, we actually there's two reasons why we do this. One, we want to focus on safety for the the defense, but also the offense player. So, remember the whole you know the guy the brother look where they're getting tackled and they lift their arms up and they almost look yeah. like a you know flying like an angel. Yeah. What that does is it doesn't provide direct feedback for the defender because you're hitting a suspended player. So we always talk for offense. One, you want to be grounded, but also we talk about tucking our chin and keeping your your arms tight to the body. That way you're you're giving them something sturdy, but also you're protecting yourself from that that head snap. Um, so by keeping your chin tucked, because when guys get really good at this, it's impactful. And honestly, in this drill, they're actually not really supposed to go down on offense. It's not. Not necessarily they go down, but if they're doing it well, they're they're going to go down and they're going to be able to do it in a safe position because their body's tight to the um, you know, their body's all tight and in a safe and uh, in more of a compact position. Yeah. Also, the reason why we do this is we have what we call the rating system, and this is important. So, what we mean by the rating system on a contact drill, where you're making shoulder contact, so not tag off or whatever it may be, on a contact drill, we actually want the offense to rate the defender on a scale of one to ten. And we're looking for about a seven to eight. But what that does is, as a coach, you don't have you just sit back and let the players handle it. So now you might be able to see, okay, that was a, for example, on the this far right, I would say that's about a, that's about a, let's see, about a seven to six, okay. And you'll know if the offense is giving him a four or a three, you know, okay, we need to switch them because now he's giving the whole brother look, right? We want it to, we want them to be able to be be realistic, but. Also, as a defender, if he gives me a one or a two and it really was a one or a two, that gives me the green light to hit him harder, right? So mm -hmm. now I know. Now, if we get a nine or a ten, that means, okay, we're good. Scale it back a little bit. Let's, yeah. let's, let's calm yeah. down, guys. <laughs> but we're looking for about a seven or eight. And you'll know as a coach because you'll hear it. It's going to be – everyone's going to be going at once, and you'll see it. But a lot of times you get what I call the accordion. So if you're doing this with like three or four pairs at once, there's going to be guys dropping all off balance and all mm -hmm. like awkwardly. That means you're probably having some threes and fours in there. But once you guys get confident with it, they're all going to be dropping. It's going to be that simultaneous contact that we talked about. So, yes, very important for our offense to protect themselves, but also that's going to help with our, our rating system as well.
Okay. So moving on to decision-making drills. So all about situational awareness. This is about the coach and player engagement. Uh, we want to focus on decision execution. Now as a coach, you're going to ask direct questions. So you might, you're going to scale it back a little bit and say, you know, how are your feet? Or how was your pad level? How was your punch there? And let them kind of, you're giving them slight pieces of the puzzle, but not everything um, when it comes to your feedback. The reason is we're adding one or two options to the player, and you will see about a 70 to 80 percent success rate there versus the 90 to 100 with the technical, because there is supposed to be some type of failure, not at a high level, but we want them to be kind of guessing here a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here's an example of a choice drill. So this is our close, our closed space choice, emphasizing closing space, uh, primarily, honestly, and a little bit of footwork because you want to have. You want to be closing on the balls of your feet versus on your heels, and that's going to set yourself up for a good power step. But really, this is only focusing on closed space, hence the name. But here, the reason why it's a choice is because the coach is directing, giving them, okay, I'm running and I'm gathering here. If he wasn't there, it would be a close pace, close pace drill, excuse me, close space drill, uh, meaning that he's just following the designated cones and he's sprinting and gathering within those. Um, so this is our close space choice. Do you see that, coaches? Yeah. Yep. And you can break them off to the left or the right here. And it's actually, this is, you know, Nebraska running this um, initially, but yeah, they did a pretty good job of coaching it. Here's another school you doing it. Okay, so closing and gathering. And again, would you have your, your big guys doing this? Probably not every day, but I tell you this, if they, if they do it once in a while, it's going to be great for their, it's going to be great because when you have, when you have guys that can do this in close space, um, and they get out in space, or maybe they're closing space towards a quarterback. We've seen it all the time where they stop their feet and they miss a potential sack, or the guy gets flushed out the pocket. And there is some transferable skills that we want to teach. But for example, for sure. we probably for wouldn't sure. want to run this every day with your your D lineman. But you know, sprinkle yeah. it in there as you need. Okay, so that was our close space choice. So now we're going to go to a contact drill. This is going to be our choice and call this the pride the pride tackle because it really does simulate that positive angle profile tackle and it's going to be definitely a contact focused drill looking at pad level near shoulder contact and the punch and a little bit of the finish honestly so I've kind of a little bit of everything here but this is actually really yeah. this yeah. is a choice but it's pretty much it kind of serves as a game based drill because you know there's going to be some competitiveness to this because you can definitely add like a winner or a loser here um, obviously, if he you know crosses the goal line and he point for the offense, you maybe put gassers or you know do some have some fun with it, do some push ups at the end. Um, but I love doing this drill, and we're not wearing pads here, so yeah. Would I recommend maybe shells? Probably, but if you're in a pinch and you could do and you don't have pads, you definitely can do this in in the off season. Okay, so you see that here, coaches. Once the ball. The ball carrier picks the ball up. It's go time. So he can either go left or right. He's not spinning. He's not going anywhere, but really focusing on same foot, same shoulder contact. Let me go back to the first rep, coaches. So you see how I take that widen step here? I say me because I take the widen step. That's actually going to help you get into position and stay square to the runner. It's a very subtle move, but a lot of times um, – players fail to do this, whether any position, um, and it, it causes for either a false step or uh, poor poor uh, footwork in the contact. We're now they're flat-footed, okay? So also, coach, sometimes they have guys that start the defense right there on the back too close. That's going to put them at a disadvantage. And it's not. It's going to be too quick hitting. So we always yeah. recommend to have a defense uh, about two to three yards away from the, um, the pad, okay? Starting back. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's the most common mistake we always see is just the timing because this makes it awkward and basically just bumping chest the whole the whole drill. It's not yep. it's not what we want, but it's fairly low impact, honestly. It's, um, safe and effective and teaches some good some good contact um, elements. The, our big guys doing it. Okay. So that's our our goal line choice. Okay, last is we have our game based drills. So. Um, here we have more about assessment under pressure. So player centered, focus on skill execution. Um, we want to ask open-ended questions such as what went wrong, what went right. That way now as a coach, you just sit back. And the biggest thing about this coach is when you're running game-based drills, 
These are all about the player. I'm going to emphasize that. It's all about the player. So in these ones, we don't want to overcoach. It might look very ugly at first. It's going to be bad because there's unpredictability. But you just let them get reps. Go for about five, ten minutes. Let them just go. At the end, you bring them together and say, hey, what went wrong for you guys? What went right? And now you allow the player to self-evaluate and they're coaching themselves. Um, and that's the biggest thing when it comes to game-based drills. We have a tendency to, as a coach to want to stop them and, and hey, this looks bad. That's why our expectation is 60 to 70 because we don't want it to be easy. Okay, here is our tackle assessment. So as you see here, um, our defense is going to be on the top of the screen. Our offense is going to be on the bottom. And they actually, ha on the start of the drill, they have to go backwards while we go defense goes forward. And what that does is it allows the defender to be in a controlled environment but also teach them how to close space and be confident. And this is actually one of the few drills that we um, that are more of a pre-contact focus that you could probably do live and go and do it effective because of the whole aspect of the offense going backwards. You're lessening the blow and making it more of a controlled environment versus that old school on the ground, you turn around and you, you hit yeah. each other. You remember yeah. that one? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So... This is a great drill that we actually, it's called a tackle assessment for a reason because you're going to be able to get a quick glant, glant, uh, you know, quick snapshot of where your team struggles in terms of uh, tackling. So we might run this on like day three, day two of spring or fall and see where your team's at. It might look ugly, like I said, but then maybe three or four days later, you revisit this and what we hope for is improvement. Yeah, and coach, we're just going. We're going around. They're picking their own cone, essentially where to go, or a coach telling them which way to go. And then this is, I can see a forty-five degree, and then a ninety degree. Yes, sir. Actually, so this is yeah. actually game based. So meaning that there is no predicted um, direction. It's all based on the the decision of the offense. And then the offense goes. He can either go left or right, obviously. But great question because you're going to be able to see your defenders processing. So what I mean by that is. Here, the, the offense goes to his left cone. You, you're going to see them what angles they take. For, so, so, for example, here is going to be pre, based on his um, entry level, entry angle. He should be able to track the near hit, but he almost ends up square with the runner here. Um, not terrible, but really, if you cut, come off to your right, you're going to be able to have a little bit more space, but you're going to be able to dictate the, the angle of the runner by cutting off the cut the cutback. So here he actually does a really good job right there. Let's watch this next rep. So that's going to be a tough angle. He gets there, though, by closing space really well. That was more – see that one, Coach? So yeah. that was one of the more awkward ones because there – I probably would have gone through my right-hand side, and that way once I close space, I'm, I'm almost using that sideline as an imaginary defender in a sense. Um, right. Here, that's a, that's a good one. A lot of space, but – that's a good entry level. So, yeah, great question. Yeah. I'm very unpredictable. Okay. So, here's our sumo cone game. This one's really fun. Uh, for our, our wrestlers, they're going to be really good at this. But, basically, um, what this drill does is it teaches you how to lower your body profile, but also, it's almost the whole bull in the ring type drill. But, you're going to see the offense is going to be on the back, the back side. Or, excuse me. Defense is going to be right here. Offense is going to be number 42 in this example. Starts the drill starts with my arm on defense's arm on the chest of the runner. Really want to make sure you lower your body profile. He's doing a pretty good job here. But a lot of times we have a tendency to um, actually no, excuse me. We actually want to start upright for both of us because by you dro dropping down to start the drill, you're actually kind of cheating it. So you'll see here this drill starts on whenever the defender drops his arm is go time. You have about two to three seconds to get him out of this about five yard six cone grid right here. Um, okay. So here you can see it. it's pretty funny, but he wasn't paying attention. But <laughs> that's why we're saying there's no whistle here, right? You're going to have guys waiting for the whistle at first. It's going to be awkward, but just keep on reminding him, hey, this is on defensive go. So when he drops his arm, you got to be ready as an offensive player because we, we want you to be able to, um, be able to avoid this and make him try to miss in a bolt in the ring. But here's a better example. So let's go back to start. See how he's kind of cheating the drill coaches? Not terrible, but you want to make sure he starts upright. And then start upright with his arm on the, on the chest, drops it, then we, will, we quickly lower that body profile. But you're going to see that as these reps go, they get better and better. Um, this is the best rep right here, even though he's cheating it. But watch, watch the offense. See how he makes him kind of miss a little bit? Kind of, it's an avoidance drill. So what I mean by that is we don't want it to be it's a collision head-on. You know? So this is a different variation where now 
The, off, the defense goes around the cone, okay? So a little bit more of a bull in the ring. So you see how there's levels to it, coaches? Yep. There. That's a great rep right by 38. So this one almost has... So just going back... Yes, just coach. sorry, sorry, Scott. Just going back to the uh, my hand starts on the player now. So, so what you're saying is the minute that hand drops off that player, I'm trying to like drive my feet, wrap my hands, and run him out of that. Yes, the, the exactly. cone area. So this is kind okay. of your prototype in the foam, in the in the in the core, in the box tackle. But I always say here it's actually okay to be patient. You almost want to be like kind of cat and mouse. So right here is probably one of the best reps. See how 43 kind of waits for them, kind of plays, kind of subtly moves his feet, and then he takes it. He shoots his shot when it's right. A lot of times we'll have guys that are reaching or lunging and they're doing they're shooting too early and it, it leads to um, poor shoulder contact, but also what we call the seatbelt tackle where now you're up high, you're kind of trying to strain out of the grid. We don't want that. Yeah. But that's the first progression you see. This is the second one where now we start face to face. You don't really have to do this, but you start you can start back to back to back, honestly. Offense stays in the grid, defense gets to go around the cone. So this is what you're seeing here with the second progression. And then I think I have a third one. But the third one, you can imagine, coaches, is going to be you guys are both back-to-back, -back and you guys go, you both go around the cone. So now, you know, see how there's levels to it? So now there's a little yeah, bit more. Progression. A little bit more, yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. I'm not going to say a little bit more tempo to it. Um, and you're going to see some collisions, but they should be all pretty fa uh, safe and effective as long as the offense is trying to avoid him versus trying to just, you know, send a message to him. <laughs> Right, so right. typically at the high school level, you like to see guys start running this, get, running this drill and they kind of go a little bit crazy. But you would want to you don't want to stop unless it's unsafe. Um, you that's the only time you would want to stop. All right, coaches. So now we're getting into drill to var uh, variation. So this is key when it comes to maximizing your time. This is in a sense what you need to be focusing on. And this is the only drill that actually does this out of our 35 plus drills. And it's going to be our close angle tackle drill. So this is not going to be your bread and butter drill for tracking because why? You see here that defense in blue, it focuses on closing space, angles, but also at the contact point, uh, point you're going to be focusing on footwork. So this is a great drill to run from day one because you'll, get, you'll be able to hit all those pre-contact drills. So for example, let's go through the quick progression. The close angle drill defense, you're going to go through the shoot, which you see right here, the cones, but imagine about a two to three yard shoot coaches. Offense cannot go or enter the grid until defense has entered, has closed through that, that shoot. But with a drill, there's going to be predictability. So the coach is going to say, hey, offense, you're going to your left. You're going to your right. Everyone knows at this point. So you might get two reps. Everyone's offense, go, once you once the defense closes space, go to your right. Now get two or three reps. Now we switch. Everyone going to your left, okay? So now we know. Angle choice is now, you can imagine, what defense goes to the shoot now offense you get to pick left or right so now defense right. is going to have to problem solve he's going to have to guess a little bit um so at that point the coach might be standing just standing behind a defense or to the side to be able to see okay where's his eyes at um be able to see his eye discipline and everything and then lastly is a close angle game where now defense gets to the shoot offense you can go start left start right but now you have the ability to spin cut back, make him miss, and try to beat him across his face. So this is really important because essentially and without ever changing the setup of your drill and only changing the focus, you got essentially three different drills out of it, right? So imagine you're right. running, even if, even if you have, let's say, 10, 12 minutes, you might just keep the same setup and, and just take a little bit of a pause and say, okay, now we're going to a choice. Now we're going to a game base. You're running three different drills within 12 minutes. Um, right, and that's easy easy yep. so this is the only drill that's unique to that obviously there's some drills that go from a drill to a choice but this is the only drill in our system that goes through the full full evolution of drill uh, variation okay last portion is going to be we talked a little bit about this whole palms down but real quickly we wanted to show you guys um how you're really going to be able to maximize tackling all year round and what i mean by that is even for example at washington we would do these some of these drills and like PRP, so player run practices. So as a linebacker, it was really hard for me prior to Atavis or being taught by Atavis to, to, to work on tackling all year round. It's all right? We just didn't do it, really. Um, so with this type of infrastructure, you're able to really do it in a safe and effective way, but also coaches and our players can do this in the offseason, get 
five of their guys together, all your linebackers together. And as a team captain, I would we would do this sometimes. Like in the spring, before spring ball, we would get together and we would run simple drills like this. Um, yep. So that's really important when it comes to the level of contact, especially at the high school level because all the the, um, the rules and regulations around how much contact you can have <laughs> during the exactly. season, right? This yeah. is going to be key yep. for, for the youth level and high school level. Um, so first we have palms down, which is more of a pre-contact focus, and we talked about that. Um, dino strike is a little bit probably the most unfamiliar with coaches, but essentially just think of it as a thud tempo, but you're not throwing a punch. So basically you see an example. I think I have a video, a video of it, but Seattle Defenders is basically – bracing himself he's shooting with his shoulder but he's not throwing a punch he's almost cushioning the blow for the offense that's dino strike okay thud is going to be obviously traditional you're throwing a punch but preferably you're not going to the ground um but two hard steps after contact so thud tempo so you're wrapping squeezing keeping them off the ground and then live is game like you're taking them to the ground you know preferably with a crash pad but there are some drills that you could definitely go to the ground in a safe and effective uh way so I think I have some examples, yes. So here's another example, coaches, of that that uh, that palms down. So it's going to be all examples right here. So you see how the defender's eyes are really focusing. They're almost like a laser. He's focusing on that near hip, okay? And Coach Peterson, at, at Washington, he was big on this. If you didn't if you didn't have this on 7-on-7, seven seven, that's a win for the offense. And then, that's right? So if you didn't tag right. off like this in practice, it, as a defender, as a defender, that's, that's an L for you. Um, yes. So that really taught us really good habits. And I think that's where you saw Washington take the leaps uh, once I got done playing in 2016. They really started to take that upward trend in terms of being a really high-performing defense for about three to four years. Okay. Perfect. So you see that right there? Now we're going to have a dino strike. We should. Oh, okay, right here, coaches. So here's a dino strike. This is a little bit unfamiliar. And this is going to be more of a low-impact drill type work. So it's a contact focus, but you might only run this like the first or two, first to two to three days of practice in terms of spring or fall. Is this really meant to get your players acclimated to making effective shoulder contact? So you want to stay up off the ground here, but you see how it's still a very physical hit, coaches. See how the offense is like, damn, I don't even want to get hit by this guy because <laughs> look at his face. He's like, oh, snap. Yeah. He knows what's coming. <laughs> So he's braced himself, and basically just think of it as a thud tempo without throwing a punch. That's as simple as I can say. But he still feels it. Yeah. Now here's going to be your thud tempo. And this is – let's go back to the member in the, the contact phase. I talked about eyes over the sunglasses, seeing what you're hitting. This is a great illustration of that. You see that, coaches? Yeah. His head is in a neutral position. He's seeing what he's hitting, not ducking his head. Um, so in a contact-focused drill like this – you definitely want to be, as a coach, you want to be positioned behind the offense or to the side of him. That way you're able to see the eyes of the defender, see his body position. Um, that way we're being safe. So I wanted to remind you guys of that real quick. But here's an example of yep. the tempo, which we're all familiar with. You guys see that? Yep. Two, two hard steps in the ground. And then here, lastly, is going to be your live. Um, so really funny with this is the crash pad. Now, do we need to have these? No, it's not necessary. But I do recommend that if you're going to use them, we definitely want to do it the proper way. So one thing we recommend is that when you have a, a contact drill like this, that you have the crash pad be uh, positioned about two or three yards away from the finish cone. Because a lot of times, coaches, what we see is the bag is hugged up against this cone. And what does that? What happens? The players go over the top of the bag. They say overshoot it. Yeah. yeah. Or they don't have ability to focus on their leg drive because they hit them and he's down. So here, mm -hmm. two to three yards – Oops, sorry. You'll see that he has ability to still get those those pistols in the ground, one to two hard steps. So I really like the finish here. Um, and this is a great this this video shoot you guys are seeing. These athletes actually only they learned this for the first time this on that on that day. So this is all happening mm -hmm. organically. Um, and this was really big for us to be able to get these vis visual examples and then be able to have coaches take it and get their own players doing it. That was big. So I always love to always look back on these videos and kind of bring that point up but yeah that wraps it up we're all we're all done um perfect perfect perfect